So Holly, welcome back to the show. How have you been? I've been great. Thank you so much for having me again. So audience, just to recap, and we'll put our previous conversation in the show notes. Um, but Holly and I had a conversation, gosh, a year and a half ago now, right? Mm -hmm. I think about right? that. Yeah. And Holly is a, to refresh everybody's memory, is a career counselor in a private high school here in the Metro Detroit area. And I got introduced to Holly from uh, clients of mine uh, that their daughter went to school where Holly is at. And it just sprung up this great conversation. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation today, Holly, because from our from our last conversation, I remember the the last thing you said to me, it's like, it'll be different to have this conversation with you, Paul, in another year and a half, because I'll be able to find out if I practice what I preached in sending my own daughter to school, to college. So that's where we're going to dive right into <laughs> is, did you, did you listen to your own advice? <laughs> in many ways I did, but sometimes I faltered. I am not going to lie. Um, I, so I can't, um, I, you know, it's, it's different. You know, I've, I've been doing this walk for for so many years. And then when my own child was in the process, there were moments um, that I wanted to take the reins, right? Like I wanted to direct um, maybe some of the schools she was looking at, um, talking about the essay, pushing the process a little more quickly, like, let's get this done, let's get this done, let's get this done, and not always paying attention to her cues. Um, I think I did overall okay. In fact, she told me one of the schools she was accepted to had, she had to do a survey as to why or why not she picked the school. And one of the questions was my parent had a major <laughs> influence in this decision and she checked absolutely not. So that gave me a little bit of affirmation, but I think it's hard, right? Like these are our, our babies and they're going off to a place that we're not, and, and we can't protect them anymore in, in the ways that they've been under our roof. Um, so it does, it gets scary. There's a lot of unknowns. There are so many unknowns. So did, did your daughter end up getting into the school that she wanted to? Yes. So she, my daughter was very smart about her application pool. She knew she was not going to take an ACT or an SAT. So she um, was only looking at schools that were test optional and that also their middle 50% acceptance rate was where her GPA was. So okay. she didn't apply to any schools that she didn't fit. And she also worked really hard to make sure she, she wanted to go to a small private school. So she made sure the mission statements of the school aligned with who she was because that's how fit is determined as well. So just like colleges are looking for a match um, and students are looking for a match, some of that is how do you align with the school culture? Yeah, we, I had, um, I'm not sure if you know Heidi King um, in the industry, but I had her on for, a, for a, basically a series and we talked a lot about right fit school and mm -hmm. what that meant from a, a social, a academic and a financial standpoint. Absolutely. So, can you walk us through like what was that process like for you and your daughter and trying to to find that right fit school? Right. So we talked about a lot of things about what she liked about high school, what she didn't like about high school, where there are things, experiences she wishes she had. Um, so that was one of the conversations. A lot of it came down to the campus tour, because when we did um, when she originally built her first list, she was very specific on things she was looking for. And she ended up going to a school that didn't meet some of her non-negotiables, which wow. was very interesting for me. Like she's very into aesthetic and she wanted a campus that was looked very old. Her school okay. doesn't have any old buildings on it. Um, you're right. So, so those kind of, she wanted a school that had a, a robust theater program that had musicals every year. She picked us cause she's involved in theater. She picked a school that the theater department does a musical every other year. Um, so it's really interesting. She also wanted to go pretty far away. Um, she was looking at schools as far as nine hours away by car and she ended up, be, she's an hour and 40 minutes away. So, so where um, did she end up, where did she end up choosing to go? She's at Alma college, um, oh, which, yes. and you know, I have talked when, I talked to the admissions officer again, cause I work at the high school, she went to her admissions officer was my admissions officer. I'm like, we're going to do the tour, but Danny, I don't think this is going <laughs> to happen because while I love Alma and I also went to Alma. So I was like, not even, um, it, it, you know, she had never been on campus before we drove through one time. So I'm not an alum that made my kids go to the campus quite a bit. So um, I never in a million years, she would have picked it. But as we were walking around campus, I was like, she's connecting. Yeah. And what drew her in was the, the personalized touch. A professor zoomed with her from vacation. 
Yeah, that's I, I remember that we have this we have the MIAA connection because I went yes. to Adrian. Yes. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've had um uh friends of mine tell me that you know they had no they had no idea that their sons or daughters would end up going to Adrian and then they just went for a football game or something and ended up like well, that's this place is kind of cool. And yeah, obviously. I don't know what Elma's was like. I mean, I think I've only been to campus one time for a football game, but I know since I think I've graduated, I think I graduated. I got to look at the the calendar. I think I graduated like 25 years ago from Adrian, but that school is completely different than when I went there. I mean, Absolutely. it couldn't be more different. Absolutely. No, there's definitely changes. There's things that are, that are, that are different. Um, there's things that are the same, of course, but no, it was really interesting because it's not where I thought she would end up and she is absolutely loving her time there. That is awesome. So what was it like the, the process? And, and I've written about this. We, we, I've talked with other people about it, about how important it is to put that list together. What, what was that like for, for all of you? Um, there were some tense moments in it, right? Um, just because, and not tense as far as fighting, but or, you know, in, in that way, but more of what makes sense and wasn't, what doesn't make sense. And the, one of the things I had to really make sure my daughter understood was that you are going to miss many colleges that are perfect for you. With t over 2,500 schools in our country, there is more than one right fit. So the goal is to be, have a school that looks, a list that looks like it makes sense for what you're looking for and not being afraid to cross a school off the list. You might think a school on paper is absolutely perfect for you when we look at the website, but when we get there or when you're walking around and you're talking to people, it doesn't feel quite the same as you thought it would. It's okay to cross that school off. Um, also keeping a list manageable, you know, 20 schools on a list as you're applying is way too many. At lot. some point, you're going to have to make a decision. So work to whittle that list down. Now, the caveat to that was if she was doing audition based programs for theater, we might have had a, a large, a larger list because there's a little more that goes into like the selection process. But um, but but just keeping it manageable and keeping it focused and then also keeping the focus on not the outcome of, of your applications is not a statement as to who you are as a human being. So if you don't get accepted somewhere, it is disappointing. It is hard, but that does not mean you're not smart or not a great human. It just means for some reason, your profile didn't fit what they were looking for. And sometimes that's outside of um, the actual GPA and test scores and what you're doing in high school, you know, institutional preference and institutional need comes into play. One of the the interesting things that you brought up just before we hit record that I, I wanted to swing back on was the application process itself. Mm -hmm. And I know I had this conversation with with Heidi King on this just in, in, incredible rocket of of applications that are that schools are now getting now. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to have you talk a little bit and get your your thoughts on why that is and um what what kids sh could potentially do to to help themselves stick out a little bit more in a really crowded field especially now that you know ACT and SAT scores are for the most part for most schools still optional although some schools are are now bringing right. them back right i think you know i think there's a few things i think um one as a society we are we really have created a fear around this application process, um, fear of rejection, fear of failure. And I think as parents, that's one of the biggest things we can do is help our students understand. And for ourselves too, like sometimes you don't get the result you want and that's okay. There are many perfect options for you. So we don't feed the fear, but when we feed the fear, we tend to ourselves have our students apply to more colleges because we just were kind of grasping at straws. Um, so having a balanced list is important um, and that's the schools that we're pretty sure you're going to get into and schools that might be a little bit tougher, but it's easier to apply to college now. Um, you know, back in the day when we applied, we were probably still using paper and pencil. I know I that's was right. using that pencil, a pen. I was too. Um, right. And you didn't apply to that many because it took a little bit of time to write your name out all those many times. Now it's all on one application in many cases. And sometimes the applications are free. And then after you finish all your applications, schools are sending you emails um, that say, hey, apply to us. So you click the button apply because it's free. So that it creates an artificial increase 
in applications, right? A school, if a student is applying to eight colleges or 10 colleges, or sometimes 20 or 30, depending on you know the student, um, they can only go to one. So there's seven colleges that have applications that aren't going to be utilized. Um, so I think, you know, as, as students are trying to stand out, um, one of the first things to do is not try to compare yourself to anyone else in your school. Don't, don't set up this competition because everyone is going to be read differently and uniquely um, in the process, especially if a school is using a holistic approach, meaning they're looking at your activities and your leadership and things like that. They're looking to see what you're committed to. Um, you know, you don't need 15 activities that you're involved in because you can't do that well. So find one or two things that you really enjoy and, and delve into it a little more deeply. You know, how can you change that experience for yourself and maybe bring it outside of your school? Or if it's something that you do um, outside your school, how can you bring that experience to your school? That's so it's a really, really interesting yeah. point is that, you know, you, you hear a lot about, well, you got to have all these different extracurricular activities. And what you're saying is, no, not necessarily just be good at a couple things. Absolutely. Cause there's only so many hours in the day. My goodness, my student, my high school students sometimes work harder than I do. Like their days are longer, right? Like you yeah. think about it, they're going to school all day. So they work a full-time job all day and then they have a full-time or a part-time job after school with just their extracurriculars. Um, you can only list 10 activities on the common app. That's it. So if you have too many, you have to choose anyway. Um, so you want to keep it balanced. Don't do something just because you think it's going to look good. Um, but if you're applying to more selective schools, they want to see you showing initiative. Um, so they want to see you doing something a little more unique um, in, 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 what, in what you could normally do during the day. So that's why bringing things outside of the school, bringing things into the school, those kind of things. It's it's funny because I'm already having this conversation with Madison, who's my my 13 year old triplet who's in seventh grade right now yeah. is, is, well, what am I going to do that? Because I, she's a competitive swimmer and she's in the pool for at least two to three hours, pretty much, you know, five, six days a week. Like, Absolutely. How am I going to have time to do something else? Well, and you know, that's a great point too, because that's showing depth of commitment, right? And, and colleges understand there's so many hours in the day. And as a competitive swimmer, I got issues in the pool almost every day, all year round. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, she's probably got a fall, a spring, a winter, like she's, she's, she's in the pool lot. She doesn't have a ton of time, but could she work a job at the pool teaching swim lessons that adds something else to that development? Right. Um, could she volunteer a little bit in the summer? Um, again, not over programming because beautiful things happen when we have some downtime that we're not on technology and we can right. reflect and explore and those kind of things. Um, so yeah, it's not about overwhelming and it's not about trying to pack a calendar or try to pack a schedule. It really is. What are we looking for um, and how we can enhance who you are and tell your story? So how do you think this experience in getting your daughter to Elma has impacted the way that you work with the with your kids at the at the school that you're a counselor at, counselor at. Well, that's a great question. I that wasn't even on my list. So I know, I, I know like, that's I'm okay. Like, I'm wondering, like, like how is that now that you've gone through this? Like, I wonder how that's impacted. So it's kind of a. a I have a follow up question to this, but I'm not yeah. going to ask it yet. Okay, but. so here's so I might answer your because this is how it has really. Um, it's changed the way I work with students to help them talk to their parents. Ah, uh, this is going to be good. So I always like we at my school, we do a program in the fall um, for senior parents that talks about how to support your student as they're going through this process. Um, and one of the things I recommend, which I was told by a mentor of mine many years ago, was that um, have parents set a time and families set a time once a week to talk about college. And yes. don't talk about it any other time. Give a to-do list. If your kid comes home and they've got everything done, you don't talk about it until they talk about it. Because part of that is, and this is where I would mess up with my own child sometimes, is I would bring the conversation up and she would just go into her room and close the door. Um, and the reality is there's an amount, a lot of emotion on both of our parts going yeah. through this. Like you're leaving, she's leaving, we're trying to figure this out. So when I bring it up, it might be she just can't because emotionally she is not there. But emotionally, I need to talk. So it's it's helping me. Um, I, I always tell my students, you know, we're kind of help, help in this way. We're teaching our parents how to parent um, because we've never done this before in many cases. And so how how can we say how you're feeling and what you need 
And let's come to some agreements with that. So I think that is, instead of getting frustrated with parents, I'm trying to help the students see that point of view, but then also how you engage in that conversation. So it's interesting you brought that up because I was just having, I've had this probably conversation with a fellow advisor of mine uh, a couple months ago, and he has a set of twins that are seniors going to be freshmen next year in college. And that's what he and his wife did was they scheduled one day a week where they would have the conversation other than that, like 30 or 60 minute conversation, they were yeah. not to talk about it the rest of the week because it became so emotional and so stressful. It does. It really can. Cause there's a lot, there, there's a process to it, right? So there is a physical thing. Like you, there are stuff, there are things you have to do, but there's also an emotional process that everybody is going through that doesn't have a timeline. Um, so people are going to feel things differently. My daughter likes to get things done. She was done with all her applications by Labor Day. She had all her ha her decisions in because none of her student schools had a um, a fixed release deadline. Okay. She knew all of her decisions almost, I think, by mid-October. So part of the things we had to work through was as all her friends were finding out in November and December, she had already found out. She's like, maybe I'm not as excited anymore. I'm like, you were excited. Uh -huh. Back yeah, in September, back in September and October, you were so excited about the decisions you were getting. They're feeling that now. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you're not, and, and the students that apply regular decision are just now finding out. So they haven't heard from some of these schools and everybody is talking about where they're going. And those students don't even have all their decisions in yet. So the process is very different. It's an emotional journey for everyone. Yeah. I was just going to say that had to be kind of like an emotional roller coaster for her because of, of her finding uh, she finding out so early and then another group of her friends finding out in November, December, and now right. yet another group probably is just finding out as you pointed out right now, because of, right. of, the, of how delayed things are with like fast fun and, and right. all those things. Absolutely. So it is. So the, the, the pulse of the building is very, very different. And so even the pulse of friend groups is very different. Um, and that's something that as parents, we're not necessarily navigating because that's happening day to day in school or it's on Snapchat or DMs on Instagram or whatever they're doing. Um, so, so those things are not happening that we're seeing, but there is, there's this level of, um, this level of flux, even in that friend group. So just to refresh our audience's memory. So you have your daughter, that's a freshman now at Alma, but yep. you also have, and this twins. will <laughs> this will ring true or in the hearts of, of many listeners. Cause it's a, there's a lot of, of families that have multiples that listen to this podcast. Yeah. You have a set of twins that are in eighth grade this year. Yes, I do. So we're doing the high school thing now. Um, and honestly, it's like, okay, am I ready to do another college thing in three years? <laughs> so, cause I know that's coming. Um, but yes, I do. So I have eighth grade twins. So that was going to be my follow-up question to, I ask you how, how your the experience with your daughter impacted you working with your students at your school. My follow-up question was going to be, I wonder how going through this experience with your daughter will impact you in three years going through this with your twins. I think it will. And I also think there's going to be a level of emotion that is there that wasn't present for Mackenzie. Not that I don't miss having my oldest daughter at home. My goodness, walking up the stairs, her bedroom is the first one we see. And it's still, you go there and it's empty. And when her car is in the garage, it's just like this moment where your heart is warm. Um, but they're it. Like at, when they go, it's my husband and I alone. Right. Yeah. And so it's like now we're empty nesters. So, so there's a level of emotion there that, um, that wasn't present because we still have, our, you know, the two at home. And I think, you know, the other thing too, is my kids have been in a school since preschool, um, through eighth grade, they've always been in the same classroom. So high school is going to be their first time likely apart. And oh, then college, so they could your be twins together. Yes, we did keep them together. Okay. Um, and I know everyone does something different. Mine are together. Yeah. Um, our our triplets of, were together until COVID. And then, and then we had, then, then we, we split them up. Yeah. So yeah, they no, are no, all. I say that the other way. Our triplets were split. And then when COVID came, then we put them together. Which makes sense. Cause just COVID with multiples <clears throat> oh, in was, the same grade cool. is a disaster. Like yeah. that, there was just, I, I cried all through fourth grade or the second half of fourth grade. Cause yeah. I was like, this is, I, I can't do this. Um, so yeah, so, so, so there's, there's those sentimental things that will change for my family as well. Um, 
I think for me that the biggest thing is we've worked really hard to not lump our twins together and mm -hmm. treat them as very individual people, but they're sometimes very easy, right? They're going to the same school, um, those kind of things. Um, making sure they each have their own unique process and journey. So college lists might look totally different and that's okay. They might end up in different places and that's okay. Um, whatever it might be. So, so just making sure that I'm not, you know, instead of one meeting on Sunday nights to talk about college, we're doing two meetings. So they each have their own time. Yeah. Because that's the thing is, you know, I've, I've no, I've had twins that go to the same school. I have, you know, twins are, well, I haven't had multiples yet, but yeah. that, that go to different schools. So that's yeah. going to be really interesting. And I think we're, we're, Teresa and I will fall in the same uh, arena. I think we're, you, we got to treat them as separate entities, if you will. Right. Yeah. So let's, let's flip to another, um, a topic that, that is in your wheelhouse as well, that, that will move away from college planning. And it's a, it's a, it's something personally that Teresa and I are struggling with. I think a lot of people, parents are struggling with is this, um, harmony to try to find and develop study skills yeah. with our kids. And it just seems like as we transition from um, elementary school to middle school, and even from sixth grade to seventh grade, you know, it, the, the pressure got a little bit harder this Absolutely. year. And it, it just seems like there's just this lack of, of ability to, to know what to do and when to do it. Absolutely. And what's what's interesting in this little petri dish called the Fenner family is all four of our kids could not be different. The triplets, even though and I've got mm -hmm. identical twin boys, and then Madison, the girl, and then I've got Mackenzie, our plus one. They all attack it very differently. And one's absolutely all on top of it. One's maybe in the middle, another one's maybe in the middle, and then one's like dragging up the rear. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I have that too. You have so how do you how do you, how do you deal with that Holly in your own family? But then like in the school, like, how do you, because you know, full well that that transition from high school to college can be huge. Meaning somebody that never had to, to study a lick in, in high school that got great grades now is on the other side of it, never developed those school skills. And now is, you know, facing this in college and not knowing what to do. Right. I think there's a few things that we can do for students. Um, and, and some of this is rooted like in brain science as well. So I think one of the things, um, you know, most schools are using um, platforms like Canva or Canvas or Moodle or Schoology or something like that. That's like where all they're submitting their homework and things like that. So there's an electronic piece to that. And a lot of times those come with built in calendars, but teachers use those calendars in different ways. So sometimes everything doesn't show up. So I like students to practice writing down every single day what kind of homework they have. So they're going to have a list like in, a where, planner. in an actual physical planner. Now, sometimes they want to use that electronically. Well, I use my notes app. I don't want you to use your notes app. If you don't, if you want to use a electronic device, that's fine. Let's find a calendar that let, let, let lets you do what a physical planner does. Um, there's something kinesthetic about writing. Typing doesn't engage the same way that actually physically writing does. Um, and, and so that is an important piece. So every class, if you have English first hour, you write English and then no homework. Um, also helping students understand that there's a difference between homework and studying. Homework is used to complete. And I know some middle schools, you do your homework um, in class or during a study hall or something like that. Others, you're bringing things home. Um, Homework is what you have to accomplish to turn in. That's something that's due. But we should be reviewing every single day what you did in class that day. So that's a studying piece that we miss. Um, that helps move what you've learned in the day from the short term down to the more long term memory. Then when it kind of comes time to study for the test, your cumulative review is not as hard because every day you're looking at what you learned the day before. You're making notes, you know. So in history, if we're studying the revolution, I'm going to look to make sure my notes are accurate and I'm going to jot down things that are important. So it's engaging the work a different way. Um, also, you don't sit and study for an hour 
and and then cram in another hour. Um, you need to take breaks every, you know, study for 15 or 20 minutes, get up and walk around. There's actually, um, from a science perspective, our axons and our nerves, the dendrites start to decrease and they fold in like um, petals on a flower, the more sedentary we are. So we need to get up and move to reopen those. So I think it's teaching those kind of things. Um, and as students start to see success with that, then they're able, um, then they keep doing it. Um, I have some students that recopy their notes every single night um, as a tactic to, again, to lock things in their brain. You know, I think of your daughter who's the swimmer. Um, she's got a very busy schedule. And so she's going to have to chunk her, you know, she gets into high school, her study time very, very differently. Um, so for her, having that week long view of what's coming up is going to be very important. And teaching that studying can happen at any time. So if you have, a half hour before practice, review something 15 minutes before, go do practice and then come back to your studying. What has been what has been your personal experience trying to instill that in into your three kids? Do you have any <laughs> silver bullets, <laughs> glimmer of hope that you can pass on to us that are struggling with it? I would say my daughter that's in college has been a glimmer of hope <laughs> that um, it didn't always sink in with her, um, especially in middle school. High school got better. Um, the planner was very important for her. She's a kid that in between class, she goes to the library and does her homework that's due and studies. So yeah, she is doing like nothing. that too. And that was never me, but she's never at night. Her nights are hers um, because she's done things throughout the day. Um I think the glimmer of hope is you start to see it as they as they need to use it, that you're teaching the tools. Um, you know, my my one seventh or my one eighth grader, sorry, um, they don't want to do another year of middle school. My one eighth grader comes home and does homework right away. My other one does it during break times in the school day. So I really don't know what's happening there. So that's the one that I think we're going to have to be I'm already. We've talked about, you know, this high school thing is going to be different. So the, these are the things that we're going to be doing. So it's just right now giving little nuggets, but also knowing you need that downtime as well. Yeah, it's the example you just gave is is the life that I'm leading. Like I've got one that he's a he's a pretty serious gamer, and he knows that you know homework's got to be done before he can start when he gets home and starts yeah. you know gaming, and he goes on his lunch to the library during school and gets everything done. Right. And I'm like, Andrew, like, how in the world are you doing this? Like, where is your homework? I'm like, I got it all done, dad. Yeah. And you look at his, his, his grades and he's, you know, A's and B's. Right. And so it's like, well, he must be doing something right. But right. in the back of my mind, I'm like worried because there's like, there's no planner. There's no like writing things down. Right. And, uh, th and I what... think, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. I say as he gets through this, though, like the planner will become important when he's in high school and he has more classes and more teachers wanting different things. And it might be electronic. It could very easily be electronic, but something that shows what you're doing for him. Um, ask him how he organizes that time. How does he decide what he's going to do at lunch? What order does he put it in? Because um, he has still has classes after that. So when is he doing the homework for those classes that are after lunch? Maybe on the school bus. I have no right, right. But I think those are really, so it's also going with your student, your, you know, your child's um, personality as well. He might be one that's using all of those, those, those pockets of time during the day to get things done. And that's okay. But let's talk about what that looks like. Or if you get something unexpected. And one thing that's going to happen in high school is that you're going to get a paper assigned. And that's something you have to do over time, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be things. So let's, so talk about how he's making those decisions. Um, and prioritizing and when it's all getting done, not as a scolding, right? Like, I'm just really curious because you operate in a way I don't operate. So I need to know how that works, right? Um, and, and so kind of play to that as well. Do you see, I know you're, you're in um, a private school setting, but do you see at the school that you're at that, the, that these skills are taught or is it something that the parents really have to step in and help with or the kids taking the initiative on themselves. So like my, my girl triplet Madison, the swimmer, like, thank God, I don't have to worry about her um, because she's the planner. She's the one writing everything down. Right. And like when she gets home from the pool at eight 30 at night, nine o'clock, whatever, she's studying from nine to 10 30. And 
while I really commend her and her drive, it kind of worries me because, okay, we're only in seventh grade right now. And I know that workload's only going to increase when she gets into high school. And so that's, that's already like on my, my radar screen, like, okay, how are we going to work this out? Because, you know, she talks to other girls that on her swim club that are already in high school that sometimes will be up till 12, one o'clock studying in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's not going to fly. <laughs> Well, and I think that's, you know, that that's a decision as a family on um, those are some really got good conversations to have because there's also, you know, this drive to um, take more AP classes, IB classes, whatever it might be. So really looking at balance and what makes the most sense for your schedule and what you have going on in your life, because, you know, staying up till 12 or one every so often is not a bad thing. But if that's a nightly thing, then then we're, we're physically we're not doing good by our bodies like there is a physical cost to that. Um, do high schools teach it? Yes and no. And the reason I'm going to say yes and no is because our students, um, even, even in, a, in a public school district where kids are coming from the same school, everyone's coming with different skill sets. Um, one of the things we do at my school is we interview and talk to every single one of our sophomores about their ninth grade experience. And almost every single one of them reflects on, I did not know how to study till I got to high school. Even those that had perfect grades or whatever it might have been, like that high school learning curve, um, because again, you're juggling so many different things and so many different styles and, and there's a higher level of expectation of the work you're accomplishing. So some teachers will actually like practice different kinds of note taking in those first couple of units of high school, but it all is very teacher independent or teacher dependent. Um, they learn from fellow classmates what they're doing. Um, they might have a tutor in the building that's a student tutoring group, and they learn from a peer. A lot of times hearing it from another high school student, you know, a junior or a senior or even a sophomore, all of a sudden it sinks in pretty amazingly. I, um, you know, as you age, your parents don't know quite as much, um, but your <laughs> peers know a lot. So right. um, so those kind of things can be very helpful. Yeah, because that's one of the things, like, I remember, like, that's one thing I remember about growing up, like, I didn't have, I was one of those kids that did not necessarily have to study at all during high school and basically got straight A's. And then my rude awakening was when I went to, I went to GMI first, mm -hmm. um, out of high school and boy, was that like, I had, I was a fish out of water. I had no idea what to do. Right. And yeah, you know, I made it through that first year and I was like, I, I've got to figure this out. I got to change. I got to, cause I, I can't go mm -hmm. the next three years of, of, of doing this. I can't rely on just, I don't know, book smart street. I had to have a process. And so I, I think that kind of gets into my next question. Like, how do we as parents, like, you know, obviously each of our kids is different and we're trying to help them. But then in the back of our minds, we know we have our biases from our own experience right. and not trying to force those on our kids, but knowing like how important these study skills are without becoming so overbearing that they just shut us down completely. Right. I think, you know, you can use your, your kids' grade books, right? So again, when you get in, I'm sure you have access to grades now that you yeah, can see what your electronic. students are, right? So <laughs> we can see it app. all the time. So one, don't check them during the school day and don't bombard your kids like as soon as they walk in the door, right? Like what happened in this class? What happened with this test? Um, one, your, your student might not even know because the teacher might have put it in after school and they're going to find out in the morning or whatever it might be, yeah. right? So so don't bombard them, but kind of look at what's happening. Hey, I noticed you missed this assignment. Let's talk about what happened and why you missed it. Not a how on earth could you have missed that assignment? You're so irresponsible, whatever it might be. You're never going to get into college and you're never going to make it because that's usually everything jumps to you're never going to get into college. Um, so what happened? How could you plan differently? Let's try something different. Um, and, and so using what's happening in the class and listening to the cues, like sometimes students will be like, you know, the teacher tells me like what, like we're doing, but I don't, I need to see it written down. So how can we make sure something like that happens where you can, you know, you work within your style as well, um, as far as the student. So I think that's using their grade book and where those hiccups happen. Know that there's going to be a hiccup going to high school. I think give a little bit of grace. It's so different. It's so new. Um, they're in their mind, you know, they're coming in in ninth grade, there's adults walking in the building. Like these 18 year old seniors are very different than I am coming out of middle school. So, yeah, that's, so give a, me that's a really good point. Um, and again, it's, it's different because I have such a different 
background pretty unique than, than my kids will ever have because the high school I went through K through 12 was in one building. Oh, it was yeah. a public high school. Wow. So you were, you were from a small town probably I was from then. a small, very small town. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. just outside of Adrian, well, I grew up in Adrian, but the, the high school I went to was outside and it was okay. very rural. Um, Absolutely. So it's, it's hard. Like they make this transition from a different school, from elementary to middle school and then a middle school to, to high school. And it's, you know, yeah. they, they're, you know, even when I went to Adrian, I think there's more kids, like my kids will go to Wall Lake Northern high school. There's more kids that are in that high school than I graduated from college. From, right. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so there is a transition <laughs> there, right? So trying to figure that out. And when your students, when your kids are making comments, like, well, that teacher doesn't like me. Well, what does that mean? Let's sit down and talk about it. Because there's probably something that's going on in the class. Not that the teacher doesn't like them, but there might be a frustration on the student part as to how the relationship isn't going so well. Or, you know, the teacher has their favorite. So what does that mean? So really delving into like any of those kind of things. And if there is a problem, then talk to the teacher, right? right. Um, also equipping your student, probably one of the biggest things you can do, and this is the hardest thing as a parent, um, or one of the hardest things is equipping your student to be an advocate for themselves. Yeah. So this happened, let's talk about how you're gonna talk to the teacher. And then I want you to talk to the teacher. Um, go talk to your school counselor so your school counselor can help you talk to the teacher. Who can we build relationship with so you can ask for help? Sometimes it's as simple as asking for help. Um, how, how do we do that? That is the number one thing um, that, that we need to teach our students, because at some point you can't call a college, um, and advocate for your kid. You can't really call if, if they choose to go to work or trade school after you can't call their job and say, Hey, so-and-so is struggling with you as their boss. Like that doesn't happen. So those little ways that we can teach them self-advocacy in high school, um, and only stepping in when you need to step in. There will be, there may be points where you need to step in as a parent, but let's really have our students practice that. Um, high school is a great time to practice adulting in a safe environment. It's, it's much easier to fail in high school. And that doesn't mean fail at anything, to have a misstep. When you've got the arms of your teachers and counselors watching out for you, and you have this environment that wants to help you to succeed. Like I we're am, a great place to try it. I am so glad that you brought that up. Holly, I, 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 I think that's one of the things that parents really struggle with. I know Teresa and I have is letting, letting go and having, mm -hmm. you know, the kids speak up for themselves. And yeah. I, I think that what you just explained there was extremely helpful. Um, I know I only have you for a finite period of time, so I want to yeah. get to a, a couple of closing questions. Yes. My, my first is, are there any I, I want to kind of try to incorporate this into future conversations. And, okay. and I've, I've learned this from a few podcasts I listen to as far as like, they'll ask guests like for basically for favorites, like what are you reading or watching these days mm -hmm. that, that, you know, other people might find interesting. Is there anything that you're reading or watching that, that goes along this, these topics of parenting and planning for college that, that you think parents would would or should know about? So, you know, I am a big fan of, um, I, I do a lot of podcasts and blogs. So one of my favorite ones to read all the time is the blog that comes out of Georgia Tech University. Um, Rick Clark, who is um, the head of the enrollment management there, does a brilliant job. He is a gifted writer. There's usually humor in it, but it is spot on. So I read um, his, his stuff quite a bit. Um, I read the, the Dean's blog out of UVA. Um, to just kind of keep um, University of Virginia. Again, another another good way to keep things um, to keep things in perspective um, be because there's a lot of good nuggets and a lot of good wisdom there. I think anytime, you know, I always for myself and I advise my parents and my students, when you are doing these things, um, go to the source. Don't talk to other parents about what's happening necessarily. Like try to get to the source yeah. of where things are at. So I think those are probably two things um, that that intrigue me. T to unwind, I watch documentaries. And I know that sounds really weird, but um, <laughs> I just, so like I, I, I watch documentaries to unwind. So I just watched one on um, 
cryptocurrency and the games, you know, the GameStop um, or whatever that they just, just to find, yeah. that's what I like to do um, to unwind. So, well, interesting. I, I stay away from crypto being a financial. Oh, I don't, I don't do it, but I'm just fascinated. <laughs> no, it's, by it's, it, right? it is, it is very interesting. I, I, I will give it that. It'll be interesting to see, you know, yeah. how it continues to evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm not investing, but I was just, you know, I'm fascinated on how this stuff gets started and how like people are just like, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm like, what, like, how did you just decide you're going to do this? And then it crumbles. Yeah. Um, and then my, my final question that I ask all of my guests, which is what is the best thing about being a parent since you've been on, I've already asked you this. So I'm going to, I'm going to twist that, that question a little bit and ask in your, and I forget how long you've been in, in the education space, a long time. A very long time, over 20 years. I, I was going to say over 20 years. What is the best thing about being in education? I My absolute favorite part of working with high school students is helping them figure out what's next. Um, and I also, which, which is going to sound maybe odd, I love the mess, right? Like I love, um, high school is a time there's the book work that's going on, but so much of what's happening in high school is internal, figuring out who you are, who you want to be. Friend groups are changing, all those kind of things. And while it can make me want to pull my hair out sometimes, um, I, I like working with students through that stuff because we they start to get self-agency and self-advocacy. And you can see like that student in ninth grade and who they become as a senior. And then they come and visit you sometimes when they're in college. Like I just had one of my students visit me that... Um, She's in her third year of college and we spent a lot of time together just navigating high school. And it's just so neat to see that growth. So I love that aspect of my high school work. Well, this has been, and I knew this was going to be a phenomenal conversation and you certainly, you, you brought your A plus game, oh. uh, Holly. So I can't thank you enough for, for having the conversation and, uh, we'll have to do this on an annual basis. Cause I would love to keep getting updates on McKenzie um, at Alma and how your, your twins will, uh, transition yes. into to high school. So absolutely. That, that, that'll probably be an interesting conversation for me. So yes, I would love to talk. I love talking about uh, helping students be who they're meant to be. Well, Holly, we'll put all these resources in our show notes, uh, and our previous, uh, conversation, Great. but, uh, can't thank you enough, uh, for being on the emotional balance sheet podcast. And, uh, I'm already looking forward to that next conversation. Wonderful. Have a great day.